We turn, as I already mentioned, to Psalm 46 this morning. Psalm 46. Of course, we finished uh, working our way through Joel's prophecy uh, last Sunday morning. And so we're at a a transitional period, but as I was uh, reflecting upon current events, reflecting upon uh, all of the uncertainty, the chaos, uh, really the insanity of sin that is unfolding in our nation, as I sought the Lord's leading on this matter, Psalm 46 was what came to mind. Of course, uh, if you were to rank the Psalms in, uh, in order of uh, familiarity, there would probably be at least three levels. We have our Tier 1 Psalms, and uh, Psalm 46 fits into that Tier 1 category. Uh, a Psalm that uh, is very familiar to many. A Psalm that has been uh, treasured uh, in a particular way uh, by God's people throughout the ages. So it is uh, with, with uh, a certain level of humility <laughs> that I approach such a familiar psalm. There's always a certain danger associated with familiarity, but uh, our, our confidence is that the Lord will open this psalm in a fresh way to us and that he will apply it with fresh power to our hearts this morning. And with that, then turn to the word of the Lord, Psalm 46. The title reads, For the director of music of the sons of Korah, according to Alamoth, a song. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. We all know what it is to grapple with insecurity, don't we? Now, boys and girls, uh, that's a big word, perhaps. But uh, if you think about the way that you feel in a dark room when you're all alone, you know exactly what insecurity is. You know what it is to feel afraid. You know what it is to feel uncertain. You know what it is to have your mind filled with all kinds of scary questions. But you see, those scary questions, that feeling of insecurity that you feel in a dark room at night, that doesn't go away as you get older. Oh, the the things that you fear, the the things that, that raise questions in your mind, they change. They do change. Well, perhaps, okay, so there are some older people among us who are afraid of the dark as well. But the older we get, the more that we are exposed to the world, the more our list of insecurities grows. The more the list of the things of which we are afraid continues to grow. That's just a fact of life. The more we know, the more we are inclined to fear. 
And now consider the events of the past two weeks. A, a very wicked deed has been committed. And our nation's response to this wicked deed has been to multiply wicked deeds. Uh, the response by many to this wicked deed has in turn uh, been to destroy, uh, to, to kill, to tear down, to, dest- to uh, really tear at the fabric of our society. And those of us who are watching, perhaps we feel a certain degree of insecurity. Think about the way that the psalmist describes uh, the, the, the world in verses 2 and 3 of Psalm 46. And, and tell me, does that not describe exactly what we're viewing on the media this week? Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. Does it not feel like the world is shaking? Does it not feel like our nation is beginning to crumble? Now, we've, we've talked about that for many years, of course, and we, we've seen various signs of destruction, but we see a, a, a growing tendency toward anarchy toward the casting off of all sense of law so that each does what is right in their own eyes. Each does what is right. Their their law proceeds from themselves. They are their own lawgivers. And so now those those institutions of of law and government which seem to to bring stability, they are like the the mountains, if you will, of verse 2. It's as if they're being cast into the heart of the sea. I imagine uh, a scene from a movie. We, we have these scenes, uh, cl- classic scenes that uh, appear in some form or another in, in many movies. I think Indiana Jones, you know, and, and you, you have these crusades. You, uh, you have somebody who's crusading for something. And as the movie builds to its climax, the, the hero or the heroine of the movie comes into this dangerous situation. And, and in the case of Indiana Jones, the, the world begins to crumble, literally. The ground beneath his feet begins to crumble until he's standing on a piece of stone hardly big enough to hold his two feet. That's what our world is like. Maybe the reason that's in so many movies is because that is what our world is like. Now there are times that we live with a great sense of security. But that security sometimes is built on a sense of ignorance. A certain degree of ignorance. But the the inherent insecurity of a sinful world groaning under the curse leads to the kind of things that we are seeing on our news this week. Well, that's a, that's a hard word. That's not a very comforting message. Ah, but the psalmist comes in the midst of that with Psalm 46. And, and look at this strong note on which he begins, God is our refuge and our strength, an ever-present help in trouble. You see, as the psalmist views the, the the situation in his day, as the psalmist feels those earthquakes, so to speak, feels the the world trembling on its foundations, he reminds himself, he reminds the people of God, we're not like the rest of the world. Yes, the world is insecure, but we don't have to fear. We ought not to fear. We must not fear. Because God is is our security in an insecure world. What we see here very simply is that God is a fortress giving rest from fear to all those who trust in Him. Well, we see first of all in verses 1 through 3 that the Lord protects His church in a scary world. He he doesn't flinch Notice that the psalmist doesn't flinch from the hard reality of life in the world. 
This is, this is why, it, well, one of the many reasons why the Psalms have been so precious to God's people throughout the ages. Because the, psalm, the Psalms don't say, take a couple of Tylenol and you'll feel better in the morning. The Psalms don't, don't uh, put a, a, a wallpaper over the, the, the felt problems, the insecurities, the struggles that we face in the world, but the Psalms are intensely realistic. And, and the psalmist says, this happens. The earth topples on its foundations. Uh, literally, in, in the case of earthquakes and, and uh, events like that, but uh, metaphorically, the earth shakes. The earth trembles. There's this instability all around us. Those, those mountains, mountains which we associate with a sense of security, stability, unchangingness, even those mountains... Those institutions, whatever they may be, even those may be cast into the heart of the sea. And the, the sea, its waters roar and foam. The mountains quake with the surging of the waves. Now, uh, you, you folks here in the east have a better sense of that even than I do as a native Midwesterner. We have our Great Lakes, and I've seen some storms, and I know what it is to stand on the, the side of Lake Superior in the middle of a pounding winter storm and you feel the thundering of the waves in your chest. That's what something like what the psalmist is describing. You're familiar with this because you face these Atlantic storms from time to time. They're scary. They get in your head. They get in your heart. And how much scarier are the storms that are not physical? Those spiritual storms, uh, those storms that deal uh, with, with the level of your thoughts, the level of your feelings, the storms that surround you in your family, the storms that surround you in your cities, the storms that surround us in our nation and in our world. The world is a scary place. We can't get around that fact. The world is is a scary place. But the psalmist says, in the midst of that, God is our refuge and our strength. He's a fortress. He's a place where we go, the door closes, and suddenly all is calm. Sometimes when things are getting a little bit crazy in my house, Kids are yelling, screaming. Yes, that happens in the preacher's house too. You walk outside and suddenly it's so peaceful, so quiet. That's the image that the psalmist puts before us this morning. God is our refuge. He is our strength. He is a fortress. All who run into Him all who seek refuge in Him, the, the sounds, the cacophony of the world, it dies away. The heart, which is so anxious, the heart which dredges up all of those possibilities, what if, what if, what if, like the waters of the sea stirring up the dirt, we go into that refuge. The psalmist says there is a place of refuge. There is a place where those anxieties, they fall away. The sounds of the world, the sounds of war, they fall away. But that presents us immediately then with the question of what is your refuge? You see, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, he talks about refuges of lies. Now, th that may be very literal for some people, uh, for some of us, we may seek protection, we may seek security by telling lies. That, that's one way of, of seeking refuge. But the idea that Isaiah has in mind is, is really uh, refuges that lie. Refuges that make promises that they can't keep. And, and the world, the flesh presents us with so many possibilities for these refuges of lies. Our banking accounts, for example, our retirement funds, if we just have a certain amount in our banking account, 
If we have just enough in our retirement fund, then we can feel at ease. Then we can, then, then we can rest. Then this anxiety will go away. If we have the right kind of life insurance, the right kind of health insurance, then we don't need to fear about some kind of medical emergency. Or there's human relationships. Sometimes we look for security in our husband or in our wife. Or ch as children, we look for security in our parents. And, and there's, a, there's a way in which that is acceptable, biblically uh, acceptable and right, particularly with children for parents, for with wives for their husband. But the reality is that those refuges have limitations. They cannot ultimately satisfy our need. We look for refuge in political messiahs. If we just get these guys elected or these ladies elected, then everything will be okay. Then all that we've seen happening in our nation, for example, for the past 100 years, 200 years, we can rewind that. We can get back to the glory days. We seek our refuge sometimes in addictions. A form of escapism. Not really so much hiding in them, but escaping the, the, the troubles, the anxieties, the fears that we face in this world through addictions. Well, Isaiah warns uh, that these refuges of lies will be exposed by a great storm. And the Lord Jesus says uh, much the same thing in Matthew chapter 7, if you would turn there with me. Matthew chapter 7, these words are very, very familiar, uh, especially to you uh, children and young people. You probably even uh, sing a song or two about these words. Uh, Matthew 7, verse 24, Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine, everyone who hears that God is a refuge but continues to seek their refuge in something, someone else, everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. You see, the question isn't whether we're going to face storms in this world. Really, life in this world is one unbroken storm. The question is, where are we going to look for refuge against that storm? And the psalmist holds out to us this fact that God is our refuge and strength. That he's an ever-present help in trouble. Uh, the, the grammar of that second part of verse 1 is extremely vivid. Uh, designed to make a point uh, about the continual presence of God. That he is our help in trouble exceedingly much, always there. That whenever we, we begin to hear those storm winds blow, whenever we feel the earth shaking, we can be sure that He is there. That He is there to help. That He is there to, bring, uh, to restore a sense of peace, of calm. He is there to protect us. God protects His church in a scary world as a fortress. Well, secondly, God sustains His church in her warfare, and that's what we see in verses 4 through 6. Now, in the, in the ancient uh, world, uh, not just in the Near East, but really around the world, one of the major tactics of warfare was the siege. Uh, the, the strategy was this. If you, if you come up to the city, you don't even need to attack the city. But you need to simply build these, these earthen mounds around the city. You station your armies there. You cut off everybody going in and everybody coming out. You cut off any outside supply of food and drink. You basically starve the people, either A, until they die, or B, until they give up and surrender. Very effective form of warfare. Well, God as our fortress... 
he can't, the, the, nobody can lay siege to that, that fortress. Nobody can lay siege to that city in the same way. Why? Well, because there is a river, the psalmist says, a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Picture it for a moment. Picture the church, the universal church, all those saints called and uh, confirmed in faith by Jesus Christ as one big city. Now picture the, the, the way in which we are vastly outnumbered. Picture those enemy armies, not just physical people who oppose, but uh, even uh, more horrific, even more terrifying, the spiritual armies that are camped around the city of God. Think, think uh, for example, of, of Elijah with his servant. And uh, think of, of how it was that the, the, uh, the army of the Syrians surrounded them. And yet, we don't need to fear. Because we are protected, yes. But we are also sustained. We're sustained by this river whose streams make glad the city of God the holy place where the Most High dwells. Well, what is this river? What is uh, this river whose streams make glad the city of God? Ultimately, it's, it's God himself. Uh, verse 5 says, God is within her. Uh, but speaking in a New Testament context, very clearly this applies to the Lord Jesus Christ himself, does it not? For he is the water of life. And, and now you have this this river flowing through the city of God. You have this, this church gathered around this river, and you have all of these canals which are divided off the river going out to water the church so that every saint, regardless of where they are stationed, every saint, uh, regardless of what their external circumstances may be, whatever kind of difficulties they are facing, whatever kind of physical deprivation they may be dealing with, they are supplied with the water of life. Because these canals from the river of God go out to water the city of God. That we are maintained, that we are strengthened, that we have these these, uh, spiritual, the spiritual sustenance by which God maintains us. When we are discouraged, when we are faint, when we are weary, when we feel like we cannot put one foot in front of the next. Think of Elijah after his, his encounter with the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, this great victory, and then he runs and he... Remarkably, he run, outruns the chariot of Ahab. Within hours, he's in complete despair. Faint, ready to give up. I am alone. I've been so zealous for your name. I am alone. And there's the Lord, the angel of the Lord, supplying him with cakes, with water, giving him the strength that he needs to complete the work that God has called him to do. My dear brother and sister, that's what the psalmist holds out for us. For we who are inhabitants of the city of God, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. Yes, yes, verse 6, again, we have this dose of, of strong physical reality. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. It's not that the turmoil of the world has ceased. It's not that there is not a real and present danger. It is just this, that so long as we have this refuge, so long as the the city of God is supplied with this river, she is gladdened, she is strengthened. And these nations that are in an uproar around her, the kingdoms of the world that totter and fall, yet the church does not fall. That's the explicit promise in verse 5, isn't it? God is within her. She will not fall. This word fall is one of the the, uh, words that connects this psalm. We read of the mountains falling into the sea in verse 2. We read of kingdoms falling in verse 6. And then this wonderful promise in verse 5. She 
will not fall. The lot that belongs to the world, the lot that belongs to the kingdoms of the world, does not belong to the church. She will not fall. She is supported in the wilderness as as we read in Revelation. Even as the dragon has been cast down from heaven, even as he seeks to destroy the woman, the church, Satan is a fearful enemy, but he cannot compete with the Lord our God, for he has prepared a place for the woman where she will be taken care of so long as this world continues to exist. This is the comfort that we have held out for us in verses 4 through 6. So God protects His church in a scary world. He strengthens the church in her warfare. And and let's just pause and say that is emphatically the implication and the context of this psalm, is it not? The church is at war. We see that more clearly at some times than others. But dear brother, dear sister, even in the best of times in this world, as you go about your uh, normal daily activities, as you go to work, as you minister in the home, as you go to school, as you go out into the marketplace, as you sit alone at home on your computer, You are at war. That war ought not to cause you fear because you have God as your refuge. You are supplied by Him, but you are at war. Be wise. Be aware. Understand what's really going on. The Christian life is warfare. Well, then, thirdly, we see that God assures his church of his triumph in verses 8 through 10. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. In in verses 1 through 6, the psalmist has focused upon the refuge that is God, God's present uh, protection and sustenance of his church. But now, in, in beginning in verse 8, what he does is he calls us out onto the battlefield. The battlefield of history. He calls us to remember. He calls us to think about, and this, this is why the study of history is so important, isn't it? This is why the study of church history is so important. Because as we piece together uh, church history, as we piece together the history of the world, what we do not see is God as some kind of a static entity, as God who creates and then is removed at a distance from the world. We do not see God as some kind of an abstract idea or theory or person. But we see God intimately engaged in the world. He hasn't just wound it up and let it set it on its course. But he is intimately, daily, hourly, moment by moment involved in the history of the world. All of the world is following the plan that he has set for us. We see the rise of kingdoms. We see kingdoms that fall. We see great and mighty wars, horrific events in the history of the world. We see an always changing uh, geopolitical situation throughout the last 6,000 plus years. We see the church in times of of seeming uh, prosperity, and we see the church under the cross. And what, what the psalmist does here is he calls us to stop, to reflect, come out on the battlefield. Has God not been at work in history? Has God not at every moment been upholding, maintaining, and guiding all things by the word of his power? Has there been no progress? Has there been no change? 
have not those, those kingdoms, the, the kingdoms that would have uh, been uh, great and powerful in the time of the psalmist, almost ceased to be remembered so that we dig up artifacts from them now. We find buried cities. We find their old writings. And yet all of that needs to be brought into a single focus, the lens of the world under God's sovereign control. Through the lens of God as the ultimate warrior. Uh, I, I want to pick on the translation of the NIV in this particular place. In verses 7 and 11, we have the Lord Almighty. But the, the Hebrew and, and many of the older English versions translate this the Lord of hosts. The, the idea being that the Lord is the commander of an innumerable army. That he is the great captain of his army and that he leads his army forward. And as of yet, his army is undefeated. Look at the, war, look at the wars of history. Look at the rise and fall of history and, and observe this fact. That in every one of those things, God is working. Working to bring about His purposes. Working to bring about redemption. Working to bring about the new creation. Working uh, to, to bring about a world in which Christ's uh, kingship, supreme kingship as King of kings and Lord of lords is recognized and acknowledged by everyone that has ever lived. God is at work today. No, we don't have any guarantees about the future of our nation, do we? We've lived with great pride as a nation. Many times we seem to think that we will evade the same judgment that has come upon other nations. But the comfort is that we are first and foremost citizens of a heavenly kingdom. Citizens of the city of God. Citizens of that city which will never cease to exist. That city which will never be defeated. That city which is indwelt by Christ the King. That city that God is within. That city which will never fall. And we are in the army. We belong to the retinue of the Lord of armies. The one who in verse 9 makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear he burns the shields with fire. You want an image to understand the world today? Here it is. The word of the Lord is a sword. A sword that wounds the heart leading to repentance and reconciliation or a sword that will cut down the enemies of God. The Lord is in the midst of the, the universal a universal war of peace. Peace brought to all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and peace brought for all those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Peace leading up to the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness shall dwell. This is the God that we worship. Is your heart afraid today? Are you anxious This has been an anxious time, hasn't it? We, we, we continue, even with this whole COVID business, to struggle to understand what the world is going to be like moving forward, don't we? Now, boys and girls, many of you were forced to become homeschoolers, and maybe you say, I don't like my dad and mom as my teacher, and I don't want this. Parents, maybe you've decided that there was a good reason that you didn't become teachers. And you can't wait to send those children back to school. And you're just wondering what's going to happen. You're wondering what does this mean for my children's future? For some of you, perhaps your retirement funds have been cast into a complete disarray by the, the, all that's happened in the stock market. Perhaps some of you listening have lost your jobs. You don't know how you're going to move forward. And then in the midst of all of this, there's all of this tension that has erupted in our nation. Remember this. 
God is our refuge and our strength. He says in verse 10, come out, having come out onto the battlefield, having observed and cataloged the works of the Lord, be still and know that I am God. Still your anxious hearts with this reality. I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Know that, not just on an intellectual level, but study that in the Word. Pray that you would know that it would sink down deep into your hearts, that there would be this experience that you would, that you would uh, have it brought into your inmost being. I am God. And there is no other. I will be exalted. I will conquer all of my enemies. Calm your fearful thoughts. But also calm your tongues. Are you tempted to speak against God because of His providential working in your life? I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of of forgetting that every event in my life every inconvenience that I face in my day, every trial and affliction that I face in my life is brought to me by the hand of this Lord of hosts. That it is brought to me to bring forward His purpose. And there is that complaining, that murmuring in which we speak against the work of God. We complain about God's working in our lives. We complain like the Israelites of old. And then there's that active Uh, those actions by which we oppose God, those actions by which we, we understand to some extent what God is doing, but we work against it. And we see that in the nations, that the rulers of the earth, they have conspired together. And if that's you today, my dear friend, repent. The Lord of hosts is is advancing. You will not be able to withstand him and his army. He will be exalted. Then finally this, in conclusion, we have this refrain in verses 7 and 11. The Lord Almighty, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Perhaps you remember, I kind of doubt it, but perhaps you remember that when I preached on Psalm 84 some weeks ago, we had the same phrase, the God of Jacob. And uh, I, I have to confess that I took a wrong turn with that phrase when I preached that sermon. And as I reflected on this phrase this week, I thought, now why is it the God of Jacob? Why not the God of Abraham? Why not the God of Isaac? Why the God of Jacob? Well, as I went back and I examined Jacob's life, I was amazed, first of all, to see how many personal encounters he had with God. Five, at least. As he fled uh, for his life from his brother Esau in Bethel, he laid down, made a rock his pillow, and he had a dream, a glorious dream of a ladder that went up to heaven, angels ascending and descending on this ladder. And God made this promise to him in this dream, I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. Well, then again, after 20 years of serving Laban, the Lord appeared to Jacob in a dream and he called him to return to Canaan, to, the, uh, to return to the land from which he was, uh, came. And he promised him, I will be with you. Well then, as he heads back, there's this mysterious incident uh, uh, in uh, Genesis 32, verse 1. (laughs) It's very cryptic. I encourage you to look at it. Where Jacob sees, sees the angels of the Lord. That's basically what it says. He sees the angels of the Lord. And he calls that place Mahanaim, two camps, his camp, the Lord's camp. The idea being that these angels are surrounding him and his family, vulnerable as they are traveling 
uh, at a great disadvantage, and the Lord is with him, his angels accompanying him. And then, of course, not much longer, and he wrestles with the man at Peniel, the man of whom he says, I have seen God face to face. And then again, toward the, uh, much later in his life, toward the end of his life, as he goes down into Egypt, the Lord appears to him in a dream and says, I will go down to Egypt with you and I will surely bring you back again. What is the point? The God of Jacob is our fortress. Number one, the message is this. Dear brother, dear sister, dear believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord is with you. You may not feel that today. You may doubt that. You may be struggling, and I'm certain that some of us are struggling. Perhaps your struggle is known only to you, but know this. The Lord is with you, dear child of God. The Lord is with his church. But mark this as well. The first incident and the fifth incident that we've just described. In both cases, Jacob is headed away from Canaan. In both cases, he's headed away from the land of promise. In both places, he's headed away from the, the promised blessing. His life has taken a detour. He seems to, God is providentially working in his life such that the promise seems further away rather than closer. And in both cases, God adds to the promise, I will be with you. This, I will surely bring you back again. What's the point? God is with you. But he is es escorting you to that heavenly city. He is escorting us to that new Jerusalem. With God as your escort the Lord of armies at your head. You have nothing to fear. All is provided. You are safe. You are safe. You are supplied. And you are assured that you will reach your destination. You are assured that the shaking, the trembling, the mountains being cast into the sea, these billows, these waves which roar, roll, the nations which are in an uproar, the lawless deeds of men, it will not always be that. It will not always be that way. The Lord our God is bringing peace. Perfect, unbreakable, eternal peace. May we be confident in that today. May our hearts be filled with joy and gladness. May our fears be calmed. And may we look forward with great anticipation to all that awaits us because the future is promising. Let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, what can we say? You are our refuge and our strength. Forgive us, Lord, for so foolishly seeking other refuges refuges of lies. Forgive us for so foolishly being occupied and anxious about the things of the world when, the, when we could be peacefully resting in you today. Lead us back again to that fortress. Restore that peace, that peace that comes from knowing we are at peace with you, that you, the Most High God, are in your holy dwelling. And Lord, apply this word to every heart. Continue to draw many, boys, girls, men, women, to this great fortress, this great refuge that you are. For we ask it 
in the name of and for the sake of our Lord Jesus. Amen.